All right, so what am I talking about today? It's uh, does Bernanke have an exit strategy? So if you had asked me six months ago, I would say yes, he has an exit strategy and it's not going to work. If you ask me today, does Bernanke have an exit strategy? I would say no, he doesn't even have an exit strategy. So let me clarify, so you know, both answers are bad, but let me just talk you through here. And I'm gonna warn you, this talk, it's gonna be more technical than some of the other ones, so I'll, I'll do my best to not make it unbearable, but it's, it, there's no way getting around that, and this is a very important uh, topic. So as far as the exit strategy, let, let's first back up and say, why are people even talking about that? Because I know if you've been watching the commentary on Bloomberg or CNBC, or you're gonna read in the Wall Street Journal, it's becoming a bigger and bigger idea as to you know what's the Fed's exit strategy. So let me make sure you understand just what the the ostensible problem is, and then we'll see does the Fed have a way to, to uh, undo the problem or the, or the potential problem. So the first thing we need to realize is you know what do we mean when we talk about bank reserves with the Fed? And so here again, let me just start very basic because I know some of you, uh, as Doug mentioned originally, were were brought here against your will. Uh, you, you maybe didn't realize what you were getting into, so let me try to, to make this as easy as possible. When you go to a bank and you make a deposit, let's say you give them $100, they don't take that $100 and go put it in a drawer with your name on it, right? We all know that. Some of you are alarmed or you know, making phone calls. <laughs> the, so, so what happens, of course, it's a, it's a fractional reserve banking system, and what that means is the banks... They, they go ahead and, and lend out, just rounding here, of course, of the $100, let's say they lend out, when all is said and done, you know, $90 of it are out there to new, uh, in form of new loans. So at any given time, the money that's like in the bank's vaults or also it's, it's called on deposit with the Fed. So it's as if your bank itself is a customer of the Federal Reserve, and so your bank, in a sense, has a checking account with the Fed. So your bank can write checks you know, that the Fed is ultimately cashing, if you will. All right, so that's kind of the way to think about it. So a given bank, when it looks at you know, how many outstanding depo uh, deposits do our customers have, that you know, each of you has what you think, oh, I've got $1,100 in the bank, and there's other customers of your same bank who think they look at their checkbook and they say, oh, that's how much I have on deposit with that bank. So from the bank's point of view, you add all that up, and that's you know, how many liabilities the bank has in terms of checkable deposits, that all the customers, in theory, could show up and want their money that they think is on deposit with that bank you know, immediately available. And so the, the, the bank does not need to have 100% reserves on hand to be able to satisfy those requests. It only has to have a fraction, and the ratios vary depending on what the kind of account is, but let's say it's about 10%. So what that means is your bank either is in cash, you know, in the vault or in the drawers of the tellers, has to have 10% of that number of the total that its customers in theory could show up on a Tuesday at 10 and say, we want our money. Or there's another way to satisfy the legal requirement. They don't actually have that all in cash sitting in the vault on hand. They can have deposits with the Fed itself, right? So your bank, it, it satisfies its, its uh, reserve requirement, the cash on hand, but also its own checking account with the Fed, if you will. All right, so you one way to, to gauge you know, how um, expansionary is the Federal Reserve being is you look at, at reserves. So again, this is, I'll try to make this not uh, very painful. This is the kind of thing when I wanted to punish my students, I would go and give this lecture, but I'll, I'll, I'll break it down. So typically, forget the crisis, just normally, you know, five years ago, if you ask somebody, how does the Fed stimulate the economy? What happens when the Fed lowers interest rates? You know, what, what does it mean? It's not merely that the Fed chief just announces some number and then everybody goes ahead and, and starts transacting at that new number when the Fed cuts interest rates, the way the press would report it. The way they actually lower interest rates is they pump new money into the credit market. So the supply of loanable funds goes up, so the price goes down. So what happens is the Fed goes into the market, and it used to be it would buy government securities. So it would buy treasury debt that the federal government, you know, loans the federal government takes from the private sector, so there's pieces of paper floating around saying, Uncle Sam will give you whatever, $10,000 10 years from now. And that's if you hold this piece of paper. And then people buy and sell that piece of paper, and so the Federal Reserve would buy some of those from the private sector. And how does the, the Federal Reserve pay for it? It's not that Greenspan or Bernanke says, well, I can babysit your kids for you for the next three months, and then in exchange you give me some of those. They don't offer to cut your lawn. They don't give you a house. What do they do? They write a check on the Fed. All right, so you say, oh, well, how much money does the Fed have saved up to be able to write these checks? It has an infinite amount of money, not saved up, but it's just when the Fed writes a check, 
it automatically clears because they give, you know, they write it so they buy whatever, a million dollars worth of government bonds from some private owner. They write a check for a million dollars payable to that bank or that institution, and they give it to them. They deposit it in their bank, and now their bank takes that check and goes and deposits it with the Fed. And so the Fed in its computer says, okay, before you had 800 million on deposit with us, now you have 801 million on deposit with us. And you don't believe me? Look, I can, I can you know, change the zeros and ones on my computer. There it is. <laughs> right? So that's, and you, so I'm, some of you may be thinking, oh, come on, he's got to be. No, I'm not. That's, what, that's how they do it. All right? That's what it means. And so you can understand why uh, you know, Tom DiLorenzo's talk, if you're in on that, that's kind of a neat system, isn't it? You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's even easier than typically we try to think of it in terms of running the printing press. But that's actually kind of a pain because you got to go buy the paper. There's ink. You know, you, you ever get you know when you're printing off hundred dollar bills and you get the ink all over your hands and stuff. I mean, it's 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 annoying. <laughs> this you just type some things in, change the numbers in the computer, and there you go. You instantly you're a million dollars million dollars richer. Okay, so so that's how it works, and that's what you can see the way they let me let me put it this way. If the Fed didn't inject money into the credit market, suppose when the Fed wanted to increase the money supply what it did was it went out and bought uh, you know, cars, let's say. It went to used car dealers and just started writing checks for 5,000, 7,000, whatever, buying used cars and putting them on the balance sheet of the Fed. They could do that in theory, and they could have big warehouses storing you know, the Fed's cars, and that would seriously screw up the price of cars, right? That the Fed could say, you know, we want to lower the price of Hondas. How are we going to do that? We're going to stop buying so many Hondas, right? And they would just, you know, they normally bought 500 Hondas a week and they just stopped, well, that would make the price go down, right? And they get to do the same thing if they say, you know, we want to target and have a, an $8,000 target price for, for used Hondas that are this many years old, this many miles. They could do that if they're allowed to write checks out of thin air and they could, you know, keep buying until they see the price get within the range they want and they would stop buying. And if the price falls a little too low, they start buying some more, right? So they could target the price of used cars if they wanted to. And that's the way the Fed targets the interest rate uh, of uh, you know certain types of maturities and, and uh, risk, All right? So that's how they do it. So now, uh, it, it, but then the the consequence, of course, what happens is when they're doing in the banking sector and targeting interest rates, what they're they're buying typically they used to buy government bonds, and so you know they're raising or lowering the price of a bond, but then the inverse of that is is the interest rate. So um, the one of the downsides besides just the general redistribution, right? Because if they if they started doing that with Honda dealers, you can imagine, do you think the Honda dealers would be writing op-eds saying this is a terrible system, the Fed should stop writing us checks? Do you think they would do that? No, they would talk about this is integral to the success and stability of the American economy, and it would be awful if the Fed stopped writing checks to used car dealers to buy Hondas, right? That that would be awful. They would think of all the people who would be thrown out of work, right? So they would, of course, there'd be huge interest groups, and it would be so forth, but that would screw up the economy, obviously. If you're not being richer because the Fed's taking possession of used cars. It's just redistributing resources. So the same thing here, the Fed is just redistributing resources from everybody else into the hands of the, the elites who run the banking system. Uh, but in general, the, the downside is you see prices start to go up. So the way that happens, and again, I know that this gets really complicated, but let me just try to give you the basics of it. There's, there's two different things going on, and people conflate the two a lot. Uh, when the Fed directly buys things and banks' reserves go up, that per se is not going to make the price of milk or eggs at the grocery store go up, right? Because the banks aren't using their reserves on the deposit with the Fed to go to you know, Walmart or Kroger and, and start buying food. The way that ultimately ra raises prices that everybody can see, that is typically what's called inflation in the press and what the, what the average person now thinks the term inflation means, is that you're a bank now, you have all these excess reserves, and so remember, the whole point is you're allowed to lend those out up until you hit that minimum uh, ratio that the law requires. And so if ultimately you know, one of your customers is uh, someone who owns bonds, the Fed comes in, buys bonds from them, gives them a check for a million dollars. They deposit it with you if you're just a regular commercial bank. And now you have those extra reserves, so now you're allowed to lend out more. So if someone needs a home or wants to buy a car, some business person wants a loan to expand their factory, that bank now has more available. They have room on their balance sheet, if you will, to legally make those loans. So that's another part where money gets created out of thin air. 
in a sense, right? That the bank says, okay, here, you want a loan for $10,000, we will give it to you, and they're, they're creating extra deposits in a sense out of thin air, right? So it's, there's two different steps going on, and that's where, if you remember, for those of you who were subjected to it in your college classes, where you know, they talk about the money multiplier and, and how an initial, you know, the Fed injects $1,000 and then it ends up turning into $10,000 in new money. That, that's the idea of, of what's happening. It's because there's that, uh, it's only like a 10% reserve ratio. Okay, so what's happening right now, the reason um, people are worried, but yet we haven't seen disaster strike, is that uh, starting, I guess it was last September, and then especially in October, what Bernanke did, one way he tried to rescue the economy, was he engaged in a massive expansion of the Fed's balance sheet. So just to give you an idea, in August of 2008, the amount of reserves that banks had on deposit with the Fed was about $45 billion. Okay, one, and the latest figure they have is for August of 2009. So that's 12 months later, the figure is now $829 billion. All right, so that's an increase in 12 months of 1,700%. All right, so it went up by a factor of more than 17 in one year. So let me, I was gonna bring a chart, but you guys wouldn't have been able to see it, so let me, I can do it with my arms. So from your point of view, you know, here's like the 1929 and it's going like this. So the chart looks something like this, kind of like this and then like that. Everyone see that? <laughs> That's what the chart looks like. And, and I'm not exaggerating, you actually, the chart really does look like that. It's, it's crazy. So it's most of the stuff we talk about, we say not since the 1930s has the government done such and such. And it's funny that even there you wonder, well, wait a minute, if the last time the government did these policies, we had a 10-year depression, why are they doing them again? Right, so that seems kind of odd. But we can say in terms of what the Fed's doing now that the Fed has never done this. Like even during the depression, they, didn't, they weren't this crazy. Okay, so, so that's what people are worried about. But again, obviously, you know, it's not like the price of gasoline or milk or eggs has gone up by a factor of 17. And so you wonder, well, what's, you know, is, is Bernanke doing something magical? Well, what's, the reason that, the reason that you haven't seen that is because the banks are just sitting on those reserves. So normally, the, the excess reserves, the amount of reserves banks have that they legally would have the ability to lend out, but they're just holding you know, this sort of spare reserves, that's typically pretty low, whereas now that's the bulk, you know, the bulk of what Bernanke has injected in has just been sitting there now as excess reserves. So the, uh, you know, what, why are banks doing that? Why are they sitting out and not making new loans? There's a, a few reasons. One that uh, Doug mentioned in his talk is that they're very uncertain, you know, times are frightening and if you're a bank and already you know that without this lifeline from the Fed we would be insolvent, you're, you're gonna be afraid to go out and make new loans to people um, just because that, that's riskier, puts you in an even worse position. Another contributing factor is that back in October of 2008, the Fed instituted a new policy where they started paying interest on excess reserves, okay? So before it used to be that if, you, if you're a bank and you had reserve, you know, so you have your cash in your vaults, and then you've got reserves that you're just keeping sort of like, you know, on your, in your checking account with the Fed, the, pet, the Fed paid you zero percent interest on that if you're a bank. And now they're paying, I think it's something like 0.2 percent, something like that. So they're paying a little bit, but the idea is they're, in a sense, they're bribing banks to not make loans to people, which is a little bit odd if you, you know, think about the conventional wisdom that we've all been taught. There was this huge credit crunch, but fortunately, Henry Paulson and Ben Bernanke back in September and October of 2008 saved the day with the, the $700 billion TARP package and then Bernanke doing all these unprecedented new things and that's, we averted the credit crunch and now markets are healing themselves. What's funny is if you look at the data in terms of business loans, they were at an all-time high in October 2008 and they had been steadily rising and then since all of these new you know, rescue measures were put in place, they're down about 12%. Right, so it's um, if you again from a, from your point of view, the, the graph, the business loans look like this. They hit an all-time high, and then right at the part where all these rescue measures kick in, the amount of loans goes down like that. So it's it's not necessarily the case that it's because of all the things the government's doing, but again, it's this, it's the same story that the data tell the exact opposite story of what you would have expected listening to the uh, people on CNBC explain it. Okay, so let me let's see what time we got here. Okay, let me. Uh, now that we've I sort of laid the groundwork and you understand what the problem is, so the, the, the idea is these times are strange, but if Bernanke just did nothing else and just tread water, 
and the conditions returned back to normal, and then banks started lending that out. In a sense, you know, um, rough figures, there's a room for the money supply to go up by a factor of 17, all right, because of what it, the earlier thing I talked about. So if you know, uh, a gallon of gas is $2, well, then maybe it would be 34 when things all settled down, right? So that's, that's the kind of thing that's a potential time bomb sitting there, and that's what people are worried about. So that's what they mean when they say, does the Fed have an exit strategy? But just like very quick, let me tell you something else, sort of humorous. There's a guy, his name's Scott Sumner. Some of you know him. He's a very smart guy. I'm not saying he's stupid by any stretch, but he's, he bought into Milton Friedman's explanation of the Great Depression, and Friedman said the Fed was too timid. And so Sumner has been saying that the reason we're having this trouble is the Fed has been too tight with money. And so he had a blog post one time said, does the Fed have an entrance strategy? Meaning in his mind, the Fed needs to do some more, right? So that's, you know, this, when you, you know, economists are crazy, they get an idea in their head and no matter what, it's like, well, no, we're still in this recession. So clearly the Fed hasn't pumped in enough, even though uh, they pumped in 1,700% increase in, in 12 months of reserves. So um, in any event, let's get back to, so what's, what is the Fed's exit strategy? Before, six months ago, if you asked, Bernanke, you know, what do you plan on doing? Because you've certainly done a lot, and what's, you know, isn't this a little bit dangerous? The answer was, no, no, a lot of these programs are self-liquidating. They will unwind naturally, meaning a lot of this, um, the other thing I don't have time to get into, but it's another difference between what Bernanke's doing now versus typical Fed behavior is that increase in new reserves isn't all from him buying government securities. They're buying mortgage-backed securities and other sorts of real dubious assets to get them off the books of banks that otherwise would be insolvent, right? So there's all kinds of things. And a lot of it, too, is a short-term uh, borrowing program so that the Fed, in a sense, is going up to some bank that's got millions of dollars of mortgage-backed securities on its books that if it valued it at the market price, that bank would be insolvent. And so the Fed says, tell you what, Will, and I'm simplifying, why don't you lend it to us for whatever, 30 days, 90 days, what have you, and we'll give you reserves with the Fed, which are, I was going to say as good as gold, but I don't want to make you laugh. Um, <laughs> but they're you know, unimpeachable from a legal point of view in our financial system right now. So you know, we'll give you those, and we'll value these things that I don't know exactly how much, but they certainly value them above the market value. Right? So they're being like this you know, rich uncle who bails people out by you know, doing short-term swaps of things. So that, that's another reason, too, that the banks are kind of in a precarious position is that at any moment, Bernanke could just change strategy and say, you know what, we're letting all these things unwind tomorrow, and all these, once the contract expires, a lot of this stuff, these toxic assets on the Fed's books, are going to revert to you guys, and then you'll instantly be insolvent again. So I think that's another reason that the banks are just completely under the power now of, of Ben Bernanke. Um, so so the, the question is, or Bernanke used to say, okay, we'll just let these things naturally unwind. That once the economy improves, you know, these people who are using these short-term lending facilities and what have you, they'll stop coming to the Fed to borrow at what are, you know, unreasonable terms once the market improves. That the, the Fed's terms are good right now because they're the only one willing to even deal with you guys, but once conditions improve, people won't look to the Fed, they'll look elsewhere, and so these things, so the Fed's balance sheet will just naturally shrink back down. Now, the the, the problem with that, and so that's when I, what I would have said, yeah, they have an exit strategy, but it's a bad one, so let me just very quickly tell you what the problem with that is. That sort of assumes, so, so he's sort of imagining that the, you know, the Fed inhales and, and sucks in all these assets onto its books and pumps in the reserves, and then it's just a matter of undoing everything once conditions improve, that the banks will take their assets, you know, the Fed will be able to sell off those assets, shrink its balance sheet, and suck reserves out of the system, and everything will go back to the way it was before the crisis. But the problem is, what if when the Fed starts selling those things off, so let's say you know, price inflation starts kicking in and the Fed needs to unwind, what if the, the value, the market value of those things on the Fed's books is a lot lower than what the Fed paid for it? So let's take you know, the government securities. The Fed was buying a lot of government debt when long-term interest rates are very low, meaning the, the price of those securities is high. So the Fed's paying a lot of money, it's writing checks, that are boosting up the reserves banks has for these things. What happens if China all of a sudden says, you know what, we don't trust the dollar anymore, we're unloading everything, and long-term interest rates go up to 40%? Well, then if the Fed, even if it wants to unwind, is, uh-oh, prices are getting out of control, let's sell off these things and suck liquidity out, they're gonna get a lot less per government security than they paid for it. So even if they undid everything, there's still extra reserves still sitting out in the system that they can't suck back out because they're not able to 
sell them for the same price they paid for them. Okay, so that's one issue. And then another thing is that they've got hundreds of billions of mortgage-backed securities on their books as well. And so again, if the housing market recovers, that's fine, they'll just unwind. But suppose the housing market doesn't recover. Suppose there's another 5% drop over the next year. Well, then those mortgage-backed securities would drop in price. And even if the Fed then wanted to unwind, they couldn't get the same price as what they paid. So even if they undid everything, you'd still have all these you know, hundreds of billions, potentially, of um, excess reserves out there that the Fed would be literally incapable of sucking back in. Okay, so that's why I would have said six months ago they have an exit plan, but it won't work. Now they don't even have an exit plan. Lately, um, what Bernanke and other Fed officials have been stressing when people say, you know, how are you going get, to get out of this? They say, no, no, don't worry, because now we have this new tool. We're going to be able to, and you might think, oh, Timothy Geithner? No, that's not the tool. The tool is, <laughs> the, the tool is paying interest on reserves. All right, so, you know, and we talked about that a little bit before. What the, uh, what, what their plan is, or what their defense is, what they, when they say, don't worry, this, is, this isn't going to be a problem, is they say, look, the only way that, that those reserves get out in the economy and start raising prices is when banks start lending it, and so that, you know, real people have in their checking accounts more money now so they can go to the store and write checks and, and push up the prices of apples and bread and so forth. So as long as the banks continue to sit on those reserves, there's no problem. And so even when the economy recovers, if, if uh, you know, regular if mortgage rates go back up to 6 7% and uh, other interest rates start rising so that now the Fed paying whatever it is, 0.25% interest on loans is, is not attractive, and the banks say, well, rather than earning that uh, at the Fed, why don't we lend out some of those reserves and earn whatever, 8% from, sure, a borrower who's a little bit riskier than the airtight Fed, but nonetheless, I'm earning 8% instead of 0.25%. The Fed can just increase the interest it pays. That's the idea. So they can, you know, they can pay as much as they want because again, the Fed has an unlimited amount of money, and that's what they say. And that's where the discussion ends. And I kid you not, I I am the only economist that I have ever seen raise the obvious question. Okay, but isn't that a bit like you know, a household's in trouble. The guy doesn't earn that much from his job, and you know, he, they're spending too much money month after month. They keep getting deeper into debt, and they're saying, what are we going to do? We really have to. Either you have to get more money or we have to cut our spending, and the husband says, no, no, honey, our problems are solved, I just got a new credit card, right? That's, in, in, a, in a sense, the guy's right, that that does buy them some more time, right? That they can postpone the day of reckoning, but you can see how that's not really fixing the problem. So the same thing here, if the problem is you've got too many reserves out in the system and banks wanna start lending that out, and so what do you do? You need to suck those reserves back, you know, destroy them, and instead of saying, okay, how are we going to do that? Now Bernanke and his lieutenants are saying, don't worry, we will just let the reserves grow exponentially because we will start paying banks more to not lend those reserves out. But again, remember, how do they pay a bank? That means whatever the bank's deposit is with the Fed, it starts growing at a higher rate more quickly. And, and so those are just, it's like the Fed writing checks to the banks now not to buy assets, but just to say, don't make loans. And the bank says, no, but it's really profitable now to make loans. Well, here, here's a billion dollars, okay? And that's... <laughs> And that's what he's doing. But again, that pile of reserves now is just going to keep growing exponentially. And so I'm not kidding. I have never seen any other person ask, well, what do you do if we're in a stagflationary period and you, know, that you do that for a year and now the problem is whatever it is, 2% worse because you just you know, paid, had to pay banks 2% to keep them bottled up. And, and no one has ever even asked that question, let alone has Bernanke and friends given a good response. So all this stuff the last fun comment I'll leave you with or observation is all of this material, the underlying premise is, and you see this from Fed officials, you see it from Wall Street Journal writers, and you see it from you know, bloggers, is they say, well, there's no problem, there's no threat of price inflation right now because there's so much excess capacity. With unemployment this high, you can't have price inflation. Right? When, of course you can. In the 1970s, you had stagflation. Right? That, I thought the one good thing about the 70s was that was supposed to have slayed the Keynesian beast about you know, the Phillips curve that you can either have unemployment or high inflation, but you can't have both at the same time. I thought that was the one thing that we were supposed to learn from the 70s, and, and no, it wasn't. That wasn't the one thing. Um, and then you also have in modern times Zimbabwe. They had very high unemployment, and you may have heard that their inflation problem was a little bit out of hand, right? <laughs> so this idea that we can't have rising prices when unemployment you know, is, is above 6%, that's just not true. We can look in U.S. history, we can look at current history, and theoretically, 
it doesn't make sense either. Think of it this way, what's price inflation? It's caused by too much money chasing too few goods, right? That's why the unit price goes up. So during a recession, what happens? You have less real output, right? There's not many people working, so they're producing fewer things, and you've got either the same amount of money, or in our time, 17 times as much money, and people are saying, but don't worry, it's impossible, prices can't go up, right? That just doesn't make any sense, and I think uh, we're gonna learn that lesson the hard way. All right, well, thank you very much.